this lesson, we will talk about spatial curves in polar equations, but we're going to concentrate on what we're going to call the Rhodes curve. But before we actually go into detail about what a Rhodes curve is, uh, let's take a look at this introduction question. What this question is going to try to show you is how do we actually can graph a polar equation by hand? So we want to graph a polar equation by hand. We definitely want to use our table of values. And for one of the rows, we're going to have our angles. And for another row, we're going to have our value of r, which is the distance from the origin. So to properly graph the function, we need points. So how do we get those points? Well, here we have a function that we're going to try to graph. And the way that we're going to go about it is we're going to be taking a look at different angles. We're going to plug into the function, and then we're going to get an r value out. So let's graph this. Let me call this point, point one. So whenever our theta is equivalent to zero degrees, we're going to have the following, two cosine of three times zero. All I'm doing, I'm just plugging in my theta to the function. So now I got this. So now we got r equals two, the cosine of three times zero, which is zero. And now this is something that we can definitely find the value of because now the cosine of zero it's one. So now this becomes two times one, which is just two. So whenever my angle it's equivalent to zero degrees, my R is equivalent to two. So now notice that now we have an actual point. So let's plot this point on our graph. So this is saying that whenever my angle is zero degrees, I am two units away from the origin. So let me actually do this in red. So let me call it point one. So whenever my angle is zero degrees, I am two units away from the origin. So this is exactly my first point, point one. Let's get a different point now. So now let's see what happens to my function whenever I plug in a value of 15 degrees. So if I plug in a value of 15 degrees, I am going to get times 15. I'm going to get r equals 2, the cosine and 15 times 3, that's 45. The cosine of 45 is square root of 2 over 2. So therefore, my r value is square root of 2. So therefore, when my angle is 50 degrees, I am square root of 2 units away from the origin. Let me call this point P2. So where exactly is that? Again, the square root of 2. It's approximately 1.4, give and take. So now we're going to go 15 degrees. So we have now 15 degrees, and I'm going to be about 1.4 units away from the origin. So now this is my point too. And now notice that this is how we're going to get the rest of the points. Let's get another point. Let's call this point 3. So for point 3, we're going to get our function. And now we're going to plug in 30 degrees to the angle here. So now we're going to get 2 times the cosine of 3 times 30. So this is equivalent to 90. And the cosine of 90 degrees, that is 0. So now we got r being a value of 0. So therefore, when I have 30 degrees, I am 0 units away from the origin. So let's plot that point. So here we have our next point right here, which this is P3. Whenever I'm 30 degrees, I am zero units away from the origin. So let's take a look at 45 degrees. Let's call this P4. So let's see what happens. Let's see what happened at 45 degrees. So now when I got R equals two cosine of three times 45, that's equivalent to two cosine 135. But now the cosine of 135, that is equivalent to negative square root of 2 over 2. So therefore, my r has a value of just negative 2. I'm sorry, negative square root of 2. Which again, it's about approximately negative 1.4. So let's just grab this point now. This is saying that whenever, uh, oops, let me actually write down our conclusion. We said that this was equivalent to a negative 
square root of 2. So how do we graph this point? Well, all this is saying is that whenever I'm at 45 degrees, which is exactly right here, I am going to be not going towards that angle, but against that angle, negative 1.4 units. So here we have 45 degrees. And I'm not going to go 1.4 units towards 45, but I'm actually going to go 1.4 units against 45. So we're not going towards 45, but we're going against 45 degrees because my R value, it's negative. So let's just label this point. This is equivalent to P4. And I think you get the idea. You plug in a value and you get certain coordinates. Uh, let me just write down some of my conclusions. So PC, P7. For 60 degrees, we should have gotten negative 2. So let's just plug that in there. So whenever I'm at 60 degrees, at 60 degrees, I'm going to go negative 2 units. So we're not going to go 1, 2 units towards 60, but we're actually going to go again 60. So we're going to go 1, 2 units on the opposite direction. So this is going to be my P5. Now the 6 point for P6, we should have gotten negative square root of 2. So let's just plug that in there. This is the same whenever I'm at 75 degrees. I want to go negative square root of 2 units against it. So I'm not going to go towards 45, but I'm actually going to go against 45, 1.4 units. So this is about, this is my P6. And lastly, whenever we had 90 degrees, we should have gotten a value of zero. So therefore we go back to it. So now let's plug our points. And how do we plug in the points? Well, we go in order. So first we got P1, and then we're going to connect it to P2, and then we're going to connect it to P3, and then we're going to connect it to P4, then to the fifth, and then to the sixth, and then to the seven. Now, is this the whole graph of the function? No, we still got to plug in all the different values from 90 all the way to 360, but that's going to take a long time. But notice that we, we saw one we saw one characteristic when it comes to cosine function. And on our previous lesson, we stated that cosine functions are always symmetrical over the polar axis. So this is a conclusion that we gotten on our previous lesson that all cosine functions, so we have a function, a polar equation, and the only function that is used is cosine, then we know for a fact that that function will always be symmetrical over the polar axis. So where is our polar axis? Again, our polar axis is just the line or quote unquote, the x axis in some sense. So I know that if I get a portion of the graph and I know that this function, it's symmetrical over the polar axis. So therefore, if I continue this, what is missing on this function should be another curve around here. Because I know that if I get this portion and I reflect it over the polar axis, this is where it's going to land. And I notice that we still have to reflect this uh, this section of the function. And if we got P5 and we reflect it over the x-axis, we're going to land at 120, which is going to be about right here. And if I get P4 and I reflect it over the polar axis, we're going to be at about 135. And if I get P6 and I reflect it over the x-axis, we're going to be at about 105, so about right here. And now, again, we've got to just catch them here. We're going to just, but now notice that the type of function that we have here. This is just a small example of something that we call the rose curve. Because that, notice that we have different pedals. You can think of this as being one pedal, another pedal, another pedal. 
So here we have three petals and we call this a rose score because we put petals together, it kind of resembles like a, like a rose. And again, we don't always have to use the idea of symmetry. If we want to complete the curve, we need to compute the values for 90 and then, I don't know, all over values at 105, 120, 135, 150, 165. But that's going to take a lot of work. So all we did is I got an idea of the function and then I knew that this function was symmetrical over the polar axis. So I used that to my advantage and that way I was able to complete the curve. And again, this is just what we're going to be discussing today. This is what we call a rose curve. But before we actually go into details into what is a rose curve, let's verify to see if this is true. Let's graph our function to cosine of three data and see if it resembles what we got here. Yep, it resembles what we got here. So we got, here we have a pedal, here we have a second pedal, here we have a third pedal, and it seems to resemble what we got in here algebraically. So now let's go more into detail with the rose curve. So here we have the spatial graphs of polar coordinate systems. And again, we're going to concentrate on the rose curve. Let's start by defining the standard form of a rose curve. So the standard form, it's always going to be either R equals some constant, cosine, some value in front of theta, or R equals some constant, sine, some value in front of of theta. So this will always be the standard form. And right here, we're not making a little blank space on it. Those are just going to be different values that we can get in here. And what I would like for you to do is play around with those parameters. So what happens when we switch or when we have different values in front of either sine or cosine when it comes to the row curve? So let's do that on our first example here. Let's sketch the following functions. And let's try to answer the following questions. So notice that here we have three different functions that it kind of fits the standard form of a rose curve. It's some number cosine and some number in front of theta. So they all fit the same. And as a matter of fact, they have the same value of cosine and the same value inside of cosine. The only thing that is changing is the coefficient of the cosine. So now the question is, what happens as we increase the value of our coefficient. So let's start by looking at our function. Start with the first example. So we have two cosine of two theta. So if we graph that, this is what we got. This is very a nice, a nice rose curve. Uh, but what do we notice about this curve? Notice that the peak of the curves are two units away. So the highest that it goes is two units away from the origin, and that's equal to all of what we call the pedals. So here, notice that the highest point of the pedal is two units away from the origin, two units away from the origin, two units away from the origin, two units away from the origin. So that's what we can graph here. So now what happens if we change that two into a three? How is that going to affect? How is that going to affect the behavior of the function? So let's change that two into a three. We still got four pedals, so we still got the same shape, but the only thing that difference is that now we're actually three units away from the origin. So the highest point on each of the pedals is going to be three units away from the origin. What happens if we were to change that into a four? So if we change that into a four, I notice that my curve kind of expands because now the peak of my pedals are four units away from the origin. So this is four units, four units, four units, and four units. Now, let's just put a slider here and let's see. I mean, it seems that every time we increase the value in front of the cosine, it just makes my pedal a little bit bigger. Well, let's see if that is true. So that's when n is one, where my coefficient is one. You notice that as I keep increasing the value of my coefficient, my pedal seems to be increasing in value. Now let's just answer some questions. So how does the coefficient of the function affect the shape of the graph? So, so the number of pedals don't change.
what changes are the size of the pedal. So the bigger the coefficient, the larger the pedal. And again, the pedal, um, this is considered one pedal. So notice that this rose curve is, con is composed of four different pedals. So does the number of pedals change when we increase the value of the coefficients? Well, and this is, uh, this is definitely a no, uh, because we have kind of already answered it here. Now, what I would like for you to do on what is left on this lesson is, so now we know that whenever in our standard form, the higher my coefficient, regardless if it's sine or cosine, you will see the difference along the lesson. The higher my coefficient is, the more, the bigger my pedals are. So what happens now if I keep the same coefficient, but now I change the value inside of the function. So try to graph that. Consider this function and I'll put n equivalent to one, graph it, n equivalent to two, graph it, n equivalent to three, graph it, and the same, do the same for four, five, and six, and see how does this value, if what keeps increasing is not the coefficient, but what's inside the cosine function, how does that affect the behavior of my rose petal? And do the same for sine, do the same for sine. So hopefully with this, you have a better intuition as to what we refer to as the rose curve. And this concludes our lesson.